And let us get our little clickety clacks going. Hello, everybody. Evolution hour number 95. Has it been that long? My gosh. And all the telephones and clickety clack typewriters and all the exciting fancy things. And uh, here we are at tiptortukenwordpress.com. Troubles in paradise. The methodology of creationism where no creationist is safe so long as I have breath to speak. So stop sharing that and get that going. And uh, Jackson Weed is here today as well. Uh, he's often very, very busy, but uh, it's wonderful when he can be in the show because we have a bunch of delightful things to talk about here. Hi, insects are cool. And uh, all the gang in the show today. Uh, and for those of you who do not know, I put up the obligatory notification that I am analyzing the Contested Bones book by Rupi and Sanford, which was sent to me by a critic of creationism that didn't want to go through all the rigmarole of analyzing it. And they said, would you do that? And I go, sure, I get a free book. And uh, so it, it's a book that lacks an index. It doesn't have a bibliography. So I have to compile all of that. And it's staying at about the same level of about 1.7 sources per page. Um, over half of it are secondary sources. Um, a big chunk of those are just used for authority quotes of the technical papers they cite, which is about 40 some odd percent. Uh, roughly um, half are misrepresented in that it represents material that is um, um, being left out of their discussion or directly contradictory to it. Um, some of the links that I put up for the 2017 papers that uh, Rupi brought up uh, were uh, on the new datings and new information on the new uh, Naledi finds. For those of you unaware, Homo Naledi was found in 2015, and it has kind of a, a mosaic of features between Australopithecines and humans. It's got quite human feet, uh, but its anatomy is very Australopithecine, has a relatively small um, uh, head, and so it's placed very early in the brigade, Homo uh, naledi. Nobody regards it as Homo sapiens, uh, and there's so many samples in this cave. That's one of the ways that they can do. They can got lots of different, you can see more about the variation of things, so it's not some weird dwarf mutant population. But the, the datings of that particular cave came out to be quite early on, only about um, uh, 300,000 years, which is contemporary with the very early roots of Homo sapiens. So it's if if it's relatively recent form, it's unlikely to be anything like a, a close ancestor. But the question is how long it had been around. Um, uh, they, they look just on basis of its morphology to be like 2 million years or so. And it may very well have been around that long. We just don't have any examples of it uh, because of the environment that it lived in and, and the, the luck of the draw for, for capturing uh, uh, points on it. But anyway, a couple of the papers that they cited in their book, I was amused by how they were treated because they were saying that here's some new papers that have come along uh, just as we were going to press and we will make note of them, but we can't discuss anything about them except one of them he had actually already quoted from <laughs> earlier in the chapter, earlier in the book. And it was only because I spotted that. there uh, um, In building the bibliography, I go, excuse me, but you cited this earlier uh, on page 182. And the same thing goes for some of the, there was a National Geographic article that, that he bounces back and forth between using the online version and the print version as if they're two separate things, but they say the same thing for text and he seems to think that they're different somehow or other. So there's a, a, a very superficial sloppiness and inconsistency, probably <coughs> <coughs> probably because he wrote the chapter uh, chapters piecemeal and constructed most of the research and stuff on his own. There's an <coughs> <coughs> awful lot of, of duplication, um, kind of a lawyer-like bit of where you'll authority quote and then you'll authority quote the same thing again and then you'll reserve, um, uh, do the article again, uh, argument again using the same authority quotes and that's what happened here. Now the end game had to do with this dating aspect uh, where um, they're acknowledging that it's recent and they're focusing in on the fact that Naledi uh, apparently was burying its dead or deliberately putting their bodies down in there. That doesn't seem to have been a naturally deposited circumstance. And instantly that suggests ritual behavior and a level of complexity that is interesting for something that had a relatively small brain like that. And this uh, uh, brings up the minds about how cultural evolution develops uh, and uh, how far back in Australopithecines and Homo erectus and all that these sorts of behaviors might have been and where they niche things where one animal species is learning from another. And, and we don't know because we don't have a full data set. 
um, <clears throat> one of the things that stumbled along in researching all of this, and I was just talking with Jackson about this, and put a whole slew of examples in, in addition to the technical papers that you can read to find out what the scientists were saying about this, is um, some back and forth in the creationist literature. At the same time that Rupi was doing his book, he's avoided putting creationist sources in much. There's only a couple of Martin Lubinow and a few others. Uh, and I think there was a line article uh, that uh, was put in there, but he's steered clear of dealing with the creationist literature and avoided Todd Wood's Australopithecus sediba thing completely, which was interesting. You know, if you're a creationist argument, wouldn't you pay attention to your side stuff? But <clears throat> there were uh, this one uh, person, um, uh, Owix, had decided that they, they agreed functionally with the position that was being taken in Rupi's book uh, that uh, Homo naledi was part of the human barrowman. And then he decided, no. <laughs> he reanalyzed the same data and decided, uh-oh, nope, uh, they're actually not. And suddenly you had this hissy fit going between him and Todd Wood, uh, where Todd Wood was still defending the position that they are uh, part of the human barrowman. And uh, I still got to finish up some of the research on it, but it looks like there was a shift in position with ICR where initially they were taking the it's uh, a human being approach. And now at the end, they're following this Wix, uh, a Wix papers uh, to suggest, nope, they're actually um, uh, not in the barrowman. And the data hadn't changed. The reason they're having this problem is because it's it's got a mosaic of features and evolution works that way. It's not an either or, but they've got to pigeonhole it on one side of the divide uh, or other. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's an indication of that systematic fluidity and the arbitrariness of it uh, that doesn't permit them to think through stuff. Whereas I'm expecting the scientists to be drawing on, if you, the, the most recent paper, uh, that um, uh, Berger's team put up, and I put the link up to it because it's in eLife, so all of his stuff is open access. It's how fascinated and thoughtful they are about recognizing it. Berger, the guy who initially thought that they were 2 million years old, had no problem realizing, oh no, they're the dates are accurate. They're, so they're only about 250 to 300,000 years old. And we have to now make sense of what that means in terms of the dynamics of it. That shows you the difference between the scientific community where let's get the data on the field uh, and let's try to deal with it rather than the dogmatists in the creationist movement that have to ping pong back and forth. And and so now you got this situation where um, uh, a, a, a Wix and uh, it, it'll give you also a chance to see what barominology looks like, because you'll see these little boxy things with little black blobs. And it's it's how they process their information that's used functionally just ferreted out from the regular creationist, as uh, Jackson is probably well aware, looking at some of that stuff as well, that uh, they 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 go through and get the technical papers from the real scientists. They s vacuum up their systematic data points that are in their cladistic analyses, and then flush most of it down the drain as they cherry pick the bits they want to look at as diagnostic in order to arrive at the conclusions that they need. And it's it's impossible in principle for them to ever accept uh, the idea of a continuity that you've got a and you've got c down here and there's a not just a b but a whole bunch of b's and b's primes and that that are occurring that are almost and not quite the original and not yet the c but they're in the middle and they're doing exactly what you would expect uh evolutionary sequences to do and once you get over that ladder of progress issue, that's another factor. Um, if, if, I'm still quite proud of the old Planet of the Apes chapter in TIP. And if, for those of you who want a kind of a background of a lot of the history matters of how the single species concept and out of Africa, um, it's in a way moved on from that to where both sides were right and both sides were wrong. Uh, humans still originate in Africa, but even at that, they had pulses uh, and we can see for the Denisovans and the details of Neanderthal and all the rest, there was hybridization going on and gene flow that uh, was still happening with these groups that are coming off of Homo erectus uh, down to the modern times with the last 50,000 years. That's modern from, from a paleoanthropologist's point of view. Um, and um, this stuff is that that, that multi-regional model of Wolpoff in a way was perfectly valid. And yet it didn't mean that you didn't have an out of Africa pulses of African uh, uh, homo sapien populations and more than one of them. 
So we just learn more and more information on here and it becomes much richer and more interesting that it, it reminds us about the kind of cultural interactions that may have been going on in these hominid populations that were spreading around uh, in Africa, including up in the northeastern or northwestern part of Africa that they had kind of forgotten about, uh, up in the Sahara region, which was a lot not desert in those days. In fact, it looking like the that whole North Africa didn't turn into a desert until quite recently. And desertification just got on as a kind of a byproduct of the offshoot of the ending of the glacial ice age and changing wind patterns and all this other stuff is, uh, and things began to change rather rapidly to where even understanding what was going on in early Egypt uh, in dynast pre-dynastic times and down into the early pyramid building era. Uh, when the pyramids were built, it wouldn't have looked as dry and dusty as it is now. There would have been grass and, and the like going on. And uh, they found this from, uh, uh, there was a documentary, sorry for the aside, uh, but uh, there have been this fascinating uh, snippets of information where in the uh, old kingdom uh, temples and that they would often have pictures of um, uh, antelopes and things that don't live in Egypt today. Um, and um, but they did then. <laughs> and so they would, these would have been familiar things that they would have seen. Uh, and then there was a, a, a at the end of the old kingdom, there was a general climate shift that was taking place. That, uh, and there's a whole big pile of material that I've got to collate on that that's around 4500 BC, which is oddly enough, ironically, around the time that the traditional flood is supposed to have taken place globally. But it's not involving wet, it's involving dry. <laughs> and it's it's shifting these wind patterns and, and changing stuff uh, that um, how much of it is related to some volcanism and a few other factors that are going on. I got to remember to look up all of the, the I've got a pile up of information on there. But anyway, so I, I'm digressing on there. Um, uh, Brian Stevens says, uh, read they found some new little guys in the Philippines. Um, so many of these areas, the, well, of course, the, the uh, Homo floresiensis comes from that Java region. Um, and it, trying to find all the data available for hominids uh, and human evolution is tricky. First of all, you have to excavate and dig, and you have to hope that they were found and that they're going to be preserved. Tropical environments are terrible. It just dissolves the bones. That's why we have such a crappy record for chimpanzees is because they live in a place that, where that doesn't survive much. So most mammals in general uh, are known primarily from teeth. And you then you get fragmentary things so that the number of relatively complete skeletons is um, um, relatively rare. Although you can tell a lot from certain things. There was a, a creationist that, that, that uh, leapt at me on Twitter just a bit ago about the, the made up bones from Lucy. Most of the bones in Lucy are, are fake. No, idiot. If you've got most of the pelvis, you know what one half of it looks like. Animals are symmetrical. Therefore, you know what the other half of it look like. We don't have things that are off balanced in vertebrates. I and just if want you to break down when I see that kind of stupid on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is not something that's related to evolution. This is related to basic anatomy. Cuvier would have gone, poop, 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 you stupid person. This is idiotic what you're saying. And so if you've got... Um, uh, a bone on one side that's that's uh, a complete one, you know what the other one looked like. And uh, uh, there are things where you can't know. One of the things that's made uh, figuring out like who made the Laetoli footprints awkward uh, is that we don't have the, a lot of these Australopithecines feet. Uh, and we know that they're almost human, but well, not quite. The funny thing I usually say when I meet creationists of that low level is their concern is always... At a museum somewhere, the eyes had whites, like human eyes. It's like, is that, that's your biggest issue? That's your big. Not the pelvis, yeah. not the spine. The f None of it? That <laughs> None of that? You're not worried about any of that stuff? You're just worried you know, about the, the shape of the rib the cage, the, what the brain case looks like, all of that, the, the jaws, wrist. the tooth eruption patterns. I mean, yeah. that doesn't interest you. Only the damned eyeballs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they get into these little little fiddly bit detail things uh, as a way they're, they're straw grasping, and you have to remember I'm I'm viciously charitable, in that the vast majority of creationists haven't read a damn thing on this. They don't know diddly, 
and uh, all they've done is seen things they've seen on websites or stuff they've read from Sanford's books uh, or all of these kinds of, of uh, secondary source material, which if they're dutiful, like Standing for Truth is, uh, they'll be um, the creationist apologists that we were just talking about earlier and that both have debated. Um, they're, they're dutiful in memorizing the tropes but they and the terminology. Every time I hear him use the word heterozygosity, I'm just going, um, but um, they've not really made a sense of the data and then try to put it in their perspective because they haven't worked out what their perspective is. Uh, it's still a cartoon. And one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm honored to be working with Jackson in writing The Rocks Were There uh, because we're really going to be uh, highlighting their lack of perspective in their own data field that they're over and over again, whether it's on genetics or paleontology or geology or cosmology, they have a cartoon version of what they want to be true. But in working out the fiddly bit details where you have to take all the data and we got data and then making it make sense within a co coherent narrative, nah, they don't get that far. Oh, let's see what we got in here. Um, oh, oh, the, the, Korak brings up that that chronology issue, which is a really valuable one. Uh, an actual reality, 150 to 200,000 years isn't that long, uh, but in creation time, that's like 20 uh, times over. The irony is that old earth creationists and intelligent designers don't do any better, even though they don't have the compressed time frame, because in their map of time, it's it's a long bar, but it doesn't have anything in it that literally they're not thinking about this happened, okay, then this happened, then this down here and this down here, and then apply their model. Uh, design interventions are uh, kinds being made or not. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're, you're Ross or um, uh, Hayward. It's the forms, RJ, not the kinds, yeah, the yeah, forms. This, the platonic forms, yes, the structuralist forms. Uh, and Very get, different. Um, yeah, the, the, this, is a, this is a fundamental conceptual problem uh, with anti-evolutionists. Um, and, and it's going to pop up if they ever bring up the Cambrian explosion because they're talking about phyla. And you'll hear them saying that the body plans were formed and they're exactly the same. Oh, uh, well, kind of, because the, the, the basic, what makes us a chordate? Well, we got a notochord. And if you don't have a notochord, you ain't going to be a chordate. But if you got a notochord, even though it's dissolved and submerged into more complex systems later on, you're going to be a chordate. And it doesn't matter whether you're a little tunicate, you need a little bag thing on the, on the seafloor, or you're a lamprey without any jaws, or you're a, uh, a little wiggly hycoella from the Cambrian uh, that's got a protochordate, a proto-notochord. Uh, or uh, you're talking about whales and dinosaurs and birds and uh, kangaroos and kinkajous and uh, therapsids and all of those are chordates. We're chordates. That's a lot of change. And and it's it's impossible systematically. Aaron, Aaron Ra kind of goes off on this a, a, a bit too much by saying no matter how much you evolve, you're still going to be classified systematically as a chordate. But the creationist wants you to have a blob of mud turn into a human being or a cat turn into a dog or something like that. And it's got to happen right in front of you. You got to take that animal in the zoo and have it turn into something really radically different right overnight. And that's exactly what you don't have in incremental natural branching speciation taking place. And if you never build up a map of time, time slice, uh, I try to get people to conceptualize the thing as a series of time slices. So one of the ways that I can do it in just envisage that you're in a room, the room you're in, and imagine one of the walls on your room is now. And that is a map of everything that exists now, every single animal on earth. And it's busy. You, you, if, you, you, if you use post-it notes, you don't have a wall big enough to put all the different species examples out. To, and make it make sense because it's going to pet, wallpaper everything over. You're going to run out just on insects uh, long before you get down to vertebrates and all the rest. And that's just that time slice. And then imagine all the all the other little color coded uh, ones you would need for bacteria and archaebacteria and uh, kinorinks and all of these other little things that are going on in there, all of which exist now. Now. Imagine you now go back in time, you take it in your time machine and you slip back into time, say 
million years. Now you don't have those detailed time slices. You have blips, a little bit here, a little bit there, fossils here. You have evidence of bacteria here and things there, and, and it's a, a, a network, but it's only tiny little ghost fuzzy blips. But that time slice would have been just as vivid and filled to the brim with post-its if we were there to look and measure it all, but we don't. So the moment you get into the past, now you're looking at fragments. And then you have layer on layer on layer of time slice, time slice, time slice, time slice that you have to get your brain around. And, and that's just the taxonomical blips. Think that every single organism is, an, is a population. And in, within every single population, you've got each individual organism having an entire genome with alleles and variations and mutations and interacting things and then predator-prey relationships and gut bacteria. All of that's happening simultaneously. Well, you can appreciate partly how your average creationist brain is going to start leaking things <laughs> if they try to conceptualize that, let alone bring all of that data field in. And we know for a fact in reading Nathaniel Jensen and, and uh, John Sanford and uh, Jeffrey Tompkins, who are their heavy guns because they've got the degrees and things, and, and uh, Robert Carter and others, that, that all you're getting is cartoon. You're never getting that level of, of appreciation of detail. When, it, when you look at real science papers involving very specific technical subjects, that they're trying to pull in every single scrap of data point to get as accurate a picture of that time slice in effect as possible. And that's why when you, you can do things like paleo uh, uh, climatology and paleogeography of where they can work out, well, there was, must have been winds coming down from the mountain range that we know is over there from another set of data. And, and it's intricate. You don't get that with flood geology. You don't get that, uh, nothing at all uh, from the intelligent design community. You try to find an intelligent design advocate who will be able to conceptualize the time slices in any way, shape, or form. I know I've tried it with Steve Meyer in, uh, back when he was here, and nothing happened. It was just boop, deflection. It was water and a boat, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> well, for young Earth creationists, yeah. Uh, but even there, they're in a mess uh, because you still, that that's ironically the reason why only young Earth creationists do systematics. The reason why they've got baromenology, and I've, I've alluded to this before, but I'll say it again, uh, is because they've got a book, Noah's Ark. They, the, the old earth creationists don't have to worry about that. They can have a localized flood. They don't think, care about it. And they have Adam and Eve existing somewhere in the past. Uh, you Ross is like that. And there may have been a floody thing somewhere, but they don't care. And so there's, there's no working map of time for them. And then move over to intelligent design. Try to find a chronology list at all anywhere in there. They may be vaguely aware of the geological system, but that's as much as it goes. And so you can literally have an article written by uh, Steve Meyer, who thinks the Cambrian took place half a billion years ago. And he is co-authoring it with not one, but two young earth creationists. Um, I think it was Marcus Ross and Paul Nelson. And so when they're talking about the Cambrian phyla and all of this information that's generated in that supposedly, in Steve's brain, it's half a billion years ago. And in Marcus Ross's, it's 4,500 years ago during the flood. Don't we compare notes? <laughs> No, no point. And they don't because I mean, none of them have a functioning map of time. Well, so you just have to have the script down. Yeah, yeah. And and don't you in your own work, when you're looking through paleontology matters, uh, don't you always step over to the side and try to find out when it lived and to get or at least peg it into the right time frame so that you can get a sense of where it is in relation to other stuff? I do. Yeah, yeah I was. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I often try to do that. Um, I was reading a, a Matthew Heron. I was reading the Matthew Heron piece that uh, I believe you sent me. Uh, mm -hmm. He was being snarked at, and uh, he mentioned was it Bangiomorpha, and yeah. uh, which is a red algae, which which is the oldest known eukaryote of at one point two billion years ago. Of that group, I think it's the red algae that are generating eventually plants. Yeah, you have the the tree of. Uh, the diaphoretics and you have the rotophytes, which are the red algae there first. And then you have a replant, a, the green plants and their relatives and Ooh. the glaucophytes are somewhere around in there. They might be 
C. Like Brown. C. Brown is in our live feed, the live chat. C. Brown says, James, you sound extremely brainwashed. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to continue to be brainwashed. If what you mean by brainwashed is reading the technical literature, working out what I think happened, understanding your side's literature, fact checking them too, trying to figure out what yeah. they think and noticing that they don't do that. Yeah, I'm brainwashed. I'm going to stay brainwashed. I did that Sorry. just earlier today with the the new script, which I won't reveal too much, but I found a paper referenced by the side we're critiquing, and I followed up with the paper to see who had cited it or who has cited it in the years hence, and it's really mostly just been cited as this is something somebody thought. We don't agree yeah. with that. <laughs> uh, there's uh, a lot of stuff. That's uh, that's why these are, are reminding us of the tools of the trade for scholarly method. I learned this in the history area long before I was becoming fascinated with creationism and that, which was only in the 1980s as it started to say, well, excuse me, but oh, there were not dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. You know, that, that wasn't an issue in creationism uh, of 1930. They just didn't think about that kind of a thing. This is only the, the young earth flood geology that came along in the 60s, and I started bumping into it in the 1980s. Uh, but in the history area, you're doing exactly the same issues because you have a time slice. We can theoretically can, uh, assess every single person on the planet and get interviews from them and look at their birth data and their birth certificates and their statistical things and their demographics. And you could pull their genes, you could take blood samples. All of that data field is current. But the moment you step back into time, now you have fragments and, and, and worse, Whereas a rock is being honest, it's a rock and it's got crystals that tell you that it had to be formed at a particular depth or at a particular temperature and would take a particular amount of time to crystallize and all of that. And it's not being fakey about it, it just is. And you try to figure it out, but, but people can lie. People can put up propaganda. The Egyptian monuments with these spectacular things of Ramesses conquering the uh, so-and-sos, that's actually propaganda. He had a terrible defeat uh, at their hands, and he put up stuff that made it look like he didn't. And uh, that, that things, this sort of stuff happens all the time. Nobody reading Caesar's Chronicles of Gaul will recognize that he's not putting spin. He's like doing a William Barr on, on what his career was to make it look as good as possible. Same and with so the you have to. Exactly. Uh, everybody does that. There's a, a degree of honesty about uh, uh, things. And at the same time, there's always a, the potential for dissembling and misrepresentation and altering views of things. Two sides that imagine if all you knew about the history of, of 1980s uh, uh, Palestine was a scattering of propaganda work from Hamas and the Jewish Defense League and try to make sense out of all of that, you know, you're going, whoa, we've got a whole bunch of stuff on here. Uh, or, um, of sewer shapes, thank you, Brown, uh, C. Brown said, uh, uh, of C. Brown, he says, unlike creationist literature, James Downard holds up to fact checking. Yeah, I, I think um, I uh, try to play the game uh, fairly and honestly. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Jackson's word for it. Jackson doesn't expect you to do that either. Don't take C. Brown's word for it. Definitely don't take Good C. Brown's word for it. Good gravy, don't take C. Brown's word for it. <laughs> Fact check us. Hold us to account. Ask us for sources, and, and we'll be willing to do that. Um, the, the thing that you discover in uh, pushing people into source methods approach is that uh, it's a no-lose situation. It makes your case stronger, and it makes uh, the the inequities of your opponents all the more obvious. You can force them off the field by certain kinds of questions. The killer question is, gee, where did you get that from, and how did you fact check it? You get the, the complete cricket silence at that point because the vast majority of creationists, and C. Brown, you're one of them, and standing for truth. We know he doesn't fact check a damn thing. He's still no, he repeating that flap doodle about Kimura and, and the deleterious mutation stuff. I don't think he's ever bothered to read the damn paper. <laughs> oh, you know, he hasn't read that paper because he, he has no background in genetics. And I mean, I've heard he's like a nurse or something like that, but so what, <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean he has a background. In, that doesn't mean he has any kind any sort of real background in biology. Yeah. You don't have to learn yeah, about it. Oh, asks uh, whether yeah. I'd be interested in doing a Sunday show on the history of Attorney General Barr's illustrious or infamous Khmer. I'm not an expert on Barr, but I certainly would be delighted to talk about um, uh, the um, uh, recent summary of the Mueller report 
and how carefully parsed the wording is to where I'm just really interested in reading what the original report had to say. Because, and so, yeah, I would be perfectly willing to be engaged in that. Uh, as everybody that listens to me knows, I, I hold the current president of the United States in way worse contempt than any president ought to be held in if they weren't as scurrilous and pathetic as Donald Trump is. So is my position vague on this? No, I don't think so. No, uh, so yeah, that, 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 anything. Yeah, and, and it's, and it's because that I'm applying the methods issue. I'm, I'm an old Reaganite, uh, um, a middle of the roader, uh, going way back. And, uh, I'm seeing how too much of the real uh, political landscape has moved into an entirely different area. But anyway, I won't go on. Oh, so we're about halfway through the show and I definitely want to stop at around six o'clock because I got my niece and nephew, uh, here and we're going to be uh, uh, zipping around and doing stuff. And so we got to skedaddle over to get dinner and stuff. So I'll be ending off virtually at six o'clock. Uh, let me put my uh, shameless plug uh, and th thank you up here and uh, get that out of the way in the middle of the show. And then I, we will be also then discussing the part two, uh, which is the exciting world of Michael Ord's fascinating, weird world of geology. And that's uh, he's the gift that keeps on giving. I just adore that. Okay, we're waiting for our little thing to hit in here. There we go. There's some strange new button elements going on there. So everyone should be seeing uh, my uh, R, uh, RJ's patrons. Um, it has been a delightful thing having a Patreon accounts. I can see why everybody from Aaron Ra to um, uh, Richard Carrier say that they get income this way. Uh, I'm not as heavily dependent on it as, as they are at this moment, but I'd love to be as heavily dependent on it as they are. So uh, anyway, here we have our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric, and our researchers level, uh, Keith and Fino and Brad and Ralph and Meet Convert Me and Pelogia and Sur. Thank you, Pelogia. You're the one that spurred me on to a lot of this stuff. And our assistant researchers, Dara Wolf and Duranku and James Fitzwater and Kyle Frick and Yana and Staggles and Suras and Totas Real. Still got to get back to the uh, uh, Phileas Fogg um, audio recording, but it's been cold here in the winter time, and and I got to do recordings late at night to avoid traffic sounds and that getting onto the recordings of the chapters. Uh, and uh, then our friends, Eat Neil and Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Yeah. And uh, Marigale and Insects are cool. You're in the feed. And Daniel Johnson and Bo, uh, who's way over in, in uh, Europe, Denmark, I think he is. And Alex Stone and Paul Williams and Zeshi. And then some legacy patrons, people who had helped before but weren't able to continue on that. And, you know, financial troubles get the thing, uh, uh, troubles for people. So Jen B and John and Andrew and Mona and Sun and Everett, uh, every single one of you, it is much appreciated. Uh, and uh, I can certainly say that Patreon is a handy way if you've got like a buck or five bucks a month or something like that to spare, uh, and you can throw it that way or, or even uh, whatever works, float your boat on there. Uh, think about, say, uh, instead of the latte this, this uh, week, I'll throw a little bit of it RJ's way and uh, make that commitment. Uh, that all is wonderfully appreciated, and you will become one of the names of honor on the patrons list. And then uh, moving down to uh, the linkages here to um, um, don't forget my website. It's a clunky little basic WordPress site, but there's a lot of the, the work that I've already done are in PDF format. Download those, share them, use them, uh, make use of them. It can't make a difference unless you're paying attention to it and reading it. Um, I, I did a lot of history on the creationism movement and the early stages of the intelligent design movement. And uh, it's um, uh, given me the base because I'm constantly doing the research end of this that allowed me to do uh, Evolution Slam Dunk and now the new Rocks book with uh, Jackson. And uh, we'll, I'll keep at it as long as I can. Uh, there's the link to the uh, Patreon, and I've got that in the video links in the um, uh, video, so you can find it easily there. And there's also, I've got a GoFundMe uh, uh, that you can access as well. So there we go. That's uh, the shameless plug for the week. And... Um, uh, I will always shameless plug Evolution Slam Dunk. If you don't have my book, uh, please get it. Not only because I need the royalties, but literally this is a contribution to the field. I wrote Slam Dunk because nobody had written a, a proper analysis of the reptile mammal transition uh, that was designed for the public and in conjunction with showing how anti-evolutionists ignore it. This is a spectacular macroevolution case. And creationists and intelligent designers just fall over each other for dumb in how they are just not dealing with that data. And every scrap of data in that reptile mammal transition still exists and it needs to be accounted for by any model. And the fact that they haven't even gotten anywhere close to even trying 
is an indication that they can't. It's, it's a thing that evolution can account for. It's the slam dunk, and they're never going to catch up on it because the, the data field just keeps moving on that. And then our next one, hopefully, if we can get that, rocks are still there. The, the subtitle is um, uh, some um, uh, straight science answers to some bent creationist questions. And I think that's a, uh, a nice subtitle to uh, operate from. It's looking like about, what, 15, 14, 15 chapters altogether. And um, I'm, I'm doing... Like a, that, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, it's, and it's, uh, it, it's assuming at this point that some of them won't be subsumed into each other because that's still up in the air for a few of them. So, oh, C. Brown just walked into the lion's den. I read that James got a recent horrible review on Evolution Slam Dunk. Uh, C. There are a couple of people who have given it one star reviews. There's no indication they've actually read the book. None of them have discussed any of the details that I brought up. One of them, in fact, uh, clearly was making mention of um, information that I had directly pointed out was not true. Uh, and so they're just repeating tropes. So C. Brown, yeah, there, uh, there, there will always be some people who will bear false witness on these things. But I will still say I've got that wonderful four-star review from Catherine, uh, Christine Janis, who is a working mammal paleontologist, one of the major figures in the field, and she rightly calls it uh, a tour de force. And uh, uh, couldn't find any errors or mistakes, and in fact was revising her own new mammal book based on information she learned about by reading my book, which was on uh, something like the, the mammal poop from the Permian that she wasn't aware of because it was in some of the incoming technical literature. So I take a backseat to no one in trying to be very, very thorough and careful and self-vetting and meticulous. And C. Brown, if you want to rely upon twaddleists who say what you want to be true, uh, uh, in that way, well, that's what you've been doing, and that's what I suspect you're going to continue to do. Um, Insects are cool, says uh, uh, Stephen Meyer and other creationists have lots of negative reviews. Just because there's a negative review doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah, in any controversial subject, you're going to have some partisans on both sides, and some of them are going to get it a terrible review, and others are, are not, or even some major works by people that don't get any reviews at all. Uh, they're known in the field, and they're available on Amazon, but you know, look on down there and there's no reviews at all because you know uh, how many people were going to shell out the hundred and fifty dollars for uh, the um, little obscure work on a particular technical field even though it's a perfectly valid work um, that's I uh, you don't ever depend on things on that although from self-interest I want everybody who thinks my work is wonderful to make and they have their book that, and they've read it uh, to say so and uh, put a review up and because all of these ones that pop up where they buy the book or they might buy the Kindle version or something and then don't really read it um, and put up this as an opportunity so that they can put a low review to bring your ratings down, uh, that kind of trick is inappropriate. And I wouldn't want anybody to do that for uh, any work. I wouldn't want anybody to just say, uh, just offer a bad review of a creationist book without having read it. Uh, I can give a bad review to a creationist book that I've read because I've read it. And that's why I can give it a bad review because uh, I know the details. Yeah. That's what uh, Gerard Jellison did for Sanford's Genetic Entropy book. He had a very thorough uh, review yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I think I first discovered that uh, one of the references where uh, Christine Janice uh, mentioned my work was in, she was commenting on, I think, one of uh, Steve Meyer's books and pointing out that uh, that I had done this major work on this and that it was an excellent thing. If you want to find out more about this particular topic here, I recommend uh, uh, James Downard's uh, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. And uh, we'll be doing the same thing on a gigantic scale in terms of the breadth of coverage be uh, for the Answers book because nobody has uh, uh, worked through all of the connecting threads in quite the same way that we've been doing on this. And and I think it's going to be a corker of a book, Jackson. <laughs> oh, I, I agree. It's, it will cover quite a lot. Um, I've come across so many interesting topics uh, through this book. And both of us know way more about these issues than we did starting out. And yeah. I, I'm delighted with the stuff that uh, from from things like like bats pollinating Sonoran cactuses and the thing about the uh, the newts and their uh, hosts with their uh, uh, toxic toxic salamanders and things and how all of the, the the detail genetics and all that work out. There's a a colossal amount of technical literature that's out there and what we'll be doing in this book is kind of pointing the way to so many of these little issues 
as well as a lot of just fun stuff. I mean, there there is a, a, a sadistic pleasure that you can take from reading a creationist who is just willfully sticking their head up their ass with a misrepresentation of sources. It's just hilarious. Oh, insects are cool, says uh, a red genetic entropy. I think my main problem, uh, problem with it is that how do you define a beneficial mutation? Oh, there's the rub. Uh, mutations wow. can be beneficial or harmful according to environment. Indeed, that's um, when I looked into the uh, impopenum case that Behe, Michael Behe brought up at um, the Dover trial and then stuck into his 2007 book, uh, and the same thing with the chloroquine case, that when you looked at how the actual mutations played out in the molecule and why it did the things it did, that a mutation, most of the mutations involved aren't either good or bad. They're good or bad in the context with everything else. And you can see how incrementally things can develop at that, at that molecular level. But you only find that out by reading the little details on things. Um, it pops up in, in the whole genetic entropy argument because if you're thinking a mutation is either beneficial or deleterious, well, Kimura, since the 1960s on, has said, no, most of them are neutral. And it's the, that's the big blob. And a neutral mutation is not a no man's land. It's a thing that can become beneficial or deleterious depending on its context and depending on the selection pressures. But then there are some things that are just almost entirely beneficial mutations, but there's no, there's, uh, and some that are, are full-blown deleterious. Deleterious ones uh, often are involving uh, structural genes, uh, where if you have a mutation in a particular protein that has to fold in a particular way in order to do its thing, uh, any mutations that m gung up the folding process will probably kill you. And so, the, the, and, and therefore, it's one of the reasons why mutations in homeobox genes and these developmental forward, backward, up, down, dorsal, ventral, uh, that anything in there is going to really gum up the works in the early processes of development. Well, those are self-editing because anything that, that is that bad for you, you ain't going to end up having babies. So it, it deletes out. Whereas the yeah. beneficial mutations may not be beneficial to begin with. Some mutations may have ex existed. Some of the things that look like in the uh, chloroquine case have probably been around for a long time, but they, they, were, they were functionally a neutral variation that were just lying around because it didn't have an effect on something. It becomes a beneficial mutation, beneficial for the bacteria, uh, the, 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 yeah, the bacterium because it can now make use of that to be resistant to the medicine we're throwing at it. And if you're gonna argue that those mutations have to be designed, then you're saying the designer did this because he likes the, the malaria parasite a lot. Uh, this is a weird kind of a thing to deal with. Uh, so everything is context sensitive. And, and remember, it's not merely within the individual organism, it's in relation to its predators and the things it eats and its gut bacteria and the, the signaling system that's moving back and forth. So things that are operating in like the neural system or sensory inputs are different than say digestive enzymes. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff, but the scientists look into that. And in every single case, um, that kind of gee whiz thing where the creationist will say, look how fabulous and incredible this is. It has to be God's handiwork. If you, if they don't offer source citations, be very suspicious. If they do track them down, if they're really old or generic books, wonder why they're not looking at more recent research and then start Googling the topics and find out the technical literature that's on it. And you will be deliciously surprised at how much technical literature there likely is on almost all of these cases. There's some that are very difficult to explore or there's some that the tools weren't available. And so there's not a lot of work in particular areas yet but most areas do in fact have them. And it's been a learning experience for both of us on here as when we start ferreting on the, the thing that, that I, I've, I've been instilling in Jackson and that I've also used is never take the person's word for it. That, that if, they, if they slip by with a thing and they mention a technical paper, this, uh, stop and try to find it. And we have the advantage now, this is the killer thing for source methods that were, would have been very difficult, I know because it was difficult to do, back in the 1980s when almost nothing existed online. There wasn't an online. And even when it was, initially it was very limited. But we now live in a time when 80% easy 
of technical literature, including a lot of old technical literature, is accessible full text online at no cost to the scholar somewhere or other. And I know this as somebody that doesn't have enough money to be able to go buy hard copies of things off a of JSTOR every time I want to read something. That's like 15 bucks a pop. Oh, forget that. Uh, so uh, I know just how much is available. And so there's no excuse other than cramped mouse clicking finger to not be able to find this information. If I can find it and Jackson can find it, everybody else, what the hell is stopping Standing for Truth or C. Brown or Nephilim Free or any of these other apologists, Matt Powell, Kent Hovind, any of these, if they can find gibberish and balderdash so easily online, why can't they find the science? Well, I think in Kent Hovind's case, he's made a career out of it. So his, his retirement home is being built on the claims he makes. So he has no real interest at this point. Yeah, there's always that. Uh, although I, I, I do s uh, seriously differ with a lot of critics, Aaron Ra and, and uh, Steve McRae and others who are just convinced that they are scam artists, uh, that uh, Kent Hovind and Ken Ham know oh. they're spreading lies and all of that. And, and I, I, I doubt that. I but I think Ken, Ham, Ken Hovind, maybe. Uh, Ho Hovind is such a, a blatant parasite to where he hasn't had an original thought in 40 years. He, he, he is everything he does, he ferrets out from anti evolutionists and does so with complete credulity. So he will latch on to stuff and he doesn't even have consistency in his own argument. There's, there's also the selection pressure or rather the enablement pressure of his own supporters. I mean, can you imagine Matt Powell ever fact checking Kent Hovind and then telling him so? No. Or no. Steve Ander, or, or what is it? Is it Steven uh, Anderson? Yeah, any of these. And you can see that in terms of their own structural behavior. Uh, there's a trawling for ammunition, and everybody wants to get good ammunition. But the, another general rule, I will put this into the live chat, in fact. Uh, uh, read for knowledge, not ammunition. I don't care what your position is. I'm waiting for my slow feed. There we go. Make sure everything's spelled correctly. This is one of the core notations that if you are looking for ammunition for an argument and not looking at the content that you're getting it from uh so that if you read a technical paper one thing i have discovered and i'm sure jackson has had exactly the same experience that you find some technical paper that discusses the thing you're looking for but you find that it's actually more interesting on the things you didn't look for that's in that article that you that door opened up because you were reading the whole article yeah oh yeah i was doing that with a uh, a paper on algae just like last week yeah it, it's just absolutely delicious the kinds of things that you follow up on and so um uh, i also view scholarship as a contact sport and it is rough and tumble it's not for the squeamish it's not for the lazy uh it involves a lot of hard work and and diligence and sometimes you can have, well, just it, it, just as an example of that. Um, the, oh, oh, yes, we're, I don't want to forget to miss the second comments on the thing, which has to do with uh, transverse uh, um, uh, drainage. How many kids in the, in the class know what the hell that is? I didn't know what it was. You got me and on that one. It was somebody, um, uh, it was linked to uh, CMI, I think, um, um, was the one, or some internet creationist that linked to this old 2007 piece by Michael Ord on transverse drainage. I think he tends to call them water gaps. And if you envisage uh, places where there are very narrow canyons that a river is trickling down through, you wonder, how did it carve such a narrow little canyon? And of course, the creationist is arguing that it's all floodwaters that are carving all of these little things, and it's all from that single cause. Uh, and the general principle is about transverse drainage, where water is running kind of in an unusual direction. Well, it turned out to be a really interesting subject, and it's it's going to go in great detail because I found out all of this stuff. Uh, the um, uh, let me get my thing down here. There we go. Uh, I put linkages up to quite a few papers on the subject, and I'll do a pathetic show and tell. If I if I'd had more time to work out the thing, I probably would have put the image up so I could do it more officially, but we'll just do it manually. Here is one of the delicious charts in there that's looking at these four kinds of things. And you'll notice every single one involve these. Uh, I'm always weird pointing backwards on these things. 
uh, notice there's a bulge involved in the middle of it. And what it involves is pressures in tectonics that are uplifting a chunk of real estate and how it interacts with the drainage system. And one of them is one where the drainage is coming up just at around the same pace and it's able to cut through the thing, but the mountains are still rising. We find that with uh, incised canyons in the case of the Grand Canyon and also in the Nile. Uh, anything where there's a differential between the headwaters and the outlet, if the differential shift faster than the water can erode, you get a steep, narrow, incised canyon. It's just hydrodynamics. And they've got experiments with flume things and that that can replete all this stuff. And you're living it. It's a bulge, you say. Pressure, you say. Where is this headed? Oh, you filthy-minded antediluvian atheist, you. Don't you dare. No. Um, and so you can find things where there's uh, uh, deposits that are laid over one of these intrusions. And then also you can have lakes. The overflow model is where you actually do have water level coming in that then can cut down uh, uh, faster because of the change in elevations. And there's also even a thing of piracy where um, uplifts in the land causes the river to gear shift because of the relationship is to that, that bulging real estate. A bunch of different models. And by the way, uh, one of the papers, um, the um, uh, John Douglas and Mark Schmielke paper, I'm not sure whether I have the linkage up to that one because I don't think it was available full text online. But anyway, um, from 2007, that was the one where they experimentally verified all of these things. And um, uh, the um, by experimentally verifying it, they built flume tanks and they worked out all the models to show all of these different components and, and demonstrated that they could produce the landforms that they could see in the larger scale material. Um, Ord knew about this. He didn't cite it initially, but he eventually made the mistake of citing it in one of his 2013 books that he did online. And I just happened to stumble upon it to where I go, uh oh, you, you didn't discuss its content. And so here he is that he was using it to wave at um, uh, an example of where uh, old 1960s pre-tectonic works were trying to deal with this particular area in Australia. And they they were dealing with the um, uh, either the antecedents or the superimposition model, which involves sedimentation elements. And ironically, it didn't occur to Ord to think that maybe it's the water overflow model. I mean, here's Mr. Flood Geology, and it didn't occur to him that, it, that water might be involved. Well, as it turns out, this, this mountain range has been there a really long time, and then it was sea level rises during the Mesozoic. So that's where you had the water level thing from, and there are even catastrophic flash floods that occurred uh, and still do uh, in uh, Australia, and I found technical papers on that as well. Uh, it, it's just an astonishing amount of solid work, and it gets bypassed completely uh, by the creationists. Um, oh, uh, oh, B.J. Price says, did uh, James Downard and Jackson hear about Homo luzonensis yet? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, I'm sure it will be popping up. I guess this is a new Philippine find that I'm hearing some of the people bring up, and it will certainly be covered in due course in the technical literature. Most major new finds, uh, Homo naledi was odd in that respect, will end up either in science or nature, uh, r less often in proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, but science and nature, although there will probably be papers popping up in Journal of Human Evolution and uh, who knows uh, what uh, different venues on there. They'll often be, uh, depending on how difficult they are to date, and Homo uh, uh, Naledi was quite difficult. There's some other areas that were difficult to deal with because of the tropical environment, a lot of factors, or the lack of volcanic deposits available which is often how you date material. If you've got wedged in between volcanoes, uh, you can date this one relatively easy and this one relatively easy, and therefore whatever is in the middle has to be between those two. Duh. <coughs> but if you don't have that, it's much harder. So, uh, yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on all of that. And um, sometimes things can end up as flash in the pans. <coughs> they can end up mischaracterized, um, uh, although it's harder to do that in modern paleoanthropology because the techniques are much more rigorous. Um, you do occasionally find some disputes about um, uh, the systematic uh, location of things, but it's usually fairly precise <coughs> which particular genus and things it may be in, not what family it's in or what order. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we'll find out what, what the material is. The other rule is 
let the dust settle. Uh, it's okay to pay attention to news bursts that have popped out in um, BuzzFeed like or anywhere else. Asteroid impact. Yeah. And uh, uh, l let the dust settle a bit first and find out how it's looking in, in the scientific literature. And sometimes new dust can pop up decades down the field that we have a better understanding today about the dynamics of mass extinction, where uh, in the case of the KT, uh, yes, there was a gigantic impact event, but there was also the Deccan Traps volcanic eruption that had been destabilizing the system for a long time before that. And indeed, um, uh, it looks like uh, volcanic eruptions play a much bigger consistent role in mass extinctions than asteroid impacts do. Asteroid impacts happen a lot. And some of them are very, very serious. And there's some huge impact craters. But they don't always lead to mass extinction. If systems have been destabilized, having a big magma province spewing out sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide and changing things, it destabilizes the sea system before it does the land. And then if an asteroid happens to come on the end of the, on its own, might not have caused a problem. Uh, then that's just one problem too many. Although in the case of Chichalub that uh, hit the dinosaurs, that was a big splat. And so it was, it was enough to certainly make life annoying for anything around there. But even there, look at the difference between the KT that was like 75% of, um, uh, I think, either species or families went extinct. But that's picayune compared to the Permian extinction that was like 90%. And there was no asteroid impact involved in that. That was the uh, 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 Siberian traps that was doing its business, uh, the volcanic eruptions up there in Siberia. So um, if you think about severity of events, um, uh, asteroid impacts are not necessarily the be all and end all on this. Um, a, a BJ Priest of 5,000 years of active Deccan traps. So it, it's, it's uh, I think, even longer than that. Some of these things can run for like uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And just think of like, a hundred Hawaii's happening simultaneously for a uh, hundred thousand years or more. And you get some idea how, how staggering these things are. Uh, one thing that's actually fascinating about it is what doesn't stop the, the Columbia basalts apparently didn't produce um, serious um, uh, megafaunal extinctions or anything of that type. They, they may have been a relatively minor thing. The, the, the Tambora eruption, um, uh, that people had talked about for quite some time, or, or no, Toba, uh, about 70,000 years ago. Um, it looks like there were some African populations in um, um, early human history there that went through that without a blip, uh, that they were relatively immune to it. So it, it depends on the region. It depends on the circumstance on things. So we're, we're um, um, dealing with that. And it also relates to paleoclimatology, which comes into play for issues of um, uh, climate change evaluation today is what effects of carbon dioxide and what effects can alter climate and how and how resilient are your particular species to chains of interconnected keystone steep pieces and all that kind of stuff so that actually connects up with with larger issues that way it's all the same method so um um, I'm just about down to the end of the show here, and I've got to uh, go off with family and do all sort of things. So I want to make sure we cut down any last minute questions popping up in here. Uh, I think that I um, don't see anything in there. I will say again that Jackson, Weed, and I are both hot on writing the multiple chapters and cross referencing and adding on material. We're, we're adding on new stuff and that all the time because any new paper that pops up that's relevant to any of the subjects we brought up, we want to fold that into the works. So that when uh, rocks does come out, it's going to be bloody impressive. It, there will be thousands of sources in it and fully indexed and coordinated and rip snortingly funny because you just can't read some of the stupid and not go face palm. And are you serious? <laughs> it, it, yeah. It's it's weird. it's perversely funny at the same time. Um, it's going to be delightfully educational and informative as you find out about all of these incredible creatures and biology and genetics and the scientists involved. It's one thing I, I, I made a point of doing in Slam Dunk and continue to do here is that I list the, the, the names of the main authors by name and fully indexed in there rather than just citing them and not having them in the index because they do work. And, and you can start seeing patterns about the different scientists that connect up and you can find out about them. So somebody from a Lee Berger or a Simon Conway Morris or a, a, a Briggs or um, Horner, uh, that th they're people 
and they're humans. They do things. They they and everybody can theoretically do that too if you're diligent and careful. And uh, that's what the scientific process is. And even if you don't become a professional scientist, you can be interested in the work and follow the work and stand up to defend. Um, of the matter. There was just a standing for truth's debate that he had just yesterday with um, a, uh, um, a critic of creationism, but boy, that kid did not know diddly. So standing for truth was just running amok uh, in the debate because there was nobody to push back on things that are just false. And if you don't know that, you look weak and you're saying, well, I didn't study that or I don't know about that mathematics, my area. Well, then don't engage in debates. Uh, if you're not familiar with that. So um, I think that's um, the matter of uh, all the different questions and comments in the field. And I will be shutting down for the night and we will see you next week uh, with more uh, Evolution Hour and keep spreading the word. And thank you, Jackson, for uh, you're often busy with doing your work. Uh, you're a, a working kid working your way through college and writing books and doing all this stuff at the same time. Uh, nobody can accuse either one of us of, of being sluggards in this regard. <laughs> it doesn't sound so. <laughs> so I feel like it's a lot lazier than when you put it like that. <laughs> no, it, it's a, a heck of a lot of stuff that that's going on. And when you think of the fact that you have a a, a life to lead, I'm an old retired fart, so uh, I can spend my time working on a lot of these things as my uh, late time hobby. Uh, but uh, you're a young kid, and so you've got life to lead as well as your education and and the work to do to work your way through college. So I, I as somebody who uh, worked his way through college as well in back in the day. I well appreciate it. And you have a bigger problem probably than I dealt with because the, the price of college and all the infrastructure and investments you have to deal with is oh, way higher than what I had to deal with. Yeah, you get shivered. late in the show to get into this. Exactly. Well, anyway, that's the end of the show for the day. And we'll see you all next week. And, and uh, spread the word about that. And if you haven't gotten Evolution Slam Dunk, well, good gracious, what's stopping you? Okay.